Hmm, keep harassing them, but make sure that those warriors manage to beat what you send. Have the Elder Liches with the lowest number of surviving dominated forces act first so they can head back to Katza and replenish their troops. Flying high above the dissolving Beastman camps, Ludmilla issued orders while intently observing the unfolding chaos. With the Beastman forces reaching a breaking point in the valley battle, she ordered her forces to eliminate all of the identified Lord Class individuals once it appeared that a general withdrawal was being called. The point at which the Beastman broke was, of course, purposely measured out in the back and forth of the hours long battle. A hundred elder liches carefully analyzed and reported the disposition of the Beastman tribes across the front, allowing the cats a force to manage a fake stalemate that encouraged the enemy to keep fighting. Instinct and Elan appeared to be the driving forces of their enemy, making fear and hope supremely effective tools to manipulate them with. With the arrival of the infantry company that was sent out before the battle to flank them, what hope Ludmilla allowed them was unceremoniously crushed. With their leaders dealt with, the stubborn fury of the tribes shattered in the face of an overwhelming offensive. The beastman lines turned into pockets of desperate resistance, which were methodically collapsed and used to fill out the Death Knight's zombie contingents. Lady Saradnik, Psycho said to her right. We have identified a significant beastman asset. Is it the clan lord? No, the elder lich replied. The subject is of the Na variety. Hmm. Interspersed amongst the Irma were a few Na, which appeared to be composed entirely of warriors. They were all significantly stronger than the other beastmen, leading Ludmilla to believe that they were mercenaries or perhaps something analogous to the adventurers or workers operating in human lands. Let's see if we can't capture it, Ludmilla said. If their warriors order themselves by strength, this one may have a wealth of useful information. Understood. Have our Wraith contingents finished positioning themselves? Deployment along the northern border up to the Sealand River is 60% complete, the Elder Lich replied. They will be ready long before any retreating beastmen approach. Good, Ludmilla nodded. Be extra careful that our forces aren't seen close to Highfoot. Let's proceed with our plans and get the offensive for Blighthold going. Have we received any updates or amendments to our operations from the general staff? Commander Leluvian has not issued any new orders. Is there something you wish to convey to headquarters? No, just checking. Let's carry on. She turned her attention back to the throng of beastmen fleeing their camps. Similar to how wilderness tribes functioned in open warfare, only the very young and very old had been left out of the fighting. Are we letting them go? Raoul asked. They're more useful to us alive than dead, Ludmilla answered. From what we've seen so far, these beastmen care for their young. The Na defending the Irma children indicates that this protective behavior applies between the different races in their society, as well. Confused looks crossed her apprentices' faces as they listened to her from the backs of their skeletal dragons. How does that help, my lady? Olga asked, the adults are the ones that are killing everyone, aren't they? It's not so much that I'm looking for any tactical or strategic gains, Ludmilla answered. It's more that we still know very little about these beastmen. We need to develop a thorough understanding of them if we're to conduct an effective campaign. Developing a thorough understanding of their opponents would probably take longer than the campaign would last, but, hopefully, what they learned would apply to encounters with the same races in the future. Raoul adjusted his goggles as he peered down at the scattering beastmen. What do we have to watch out for? For now, Ludmilla said, it would be to what lengths they'll go to to ensure that other members of their society survive. Assuming that they will act like humans is foolish, so don't carelessly draw similarities to human behavior. We need to learn about each race by observing what we can of them and build our understanding from the ground up. Each race? That's right. The Irma, Na, Cow. Ocelo and all the other types we've seen so far are probably all different species with different behaviors. We've been running on certain assumptions based on what little we've seen and things have fortunately worked to our advantage, but assumptions based on cursory observations are not something we want to depend on forever. The long-distance observation that they would be conducting across the front would only offer broad strokes to their knowledge, but those broad strokes were probably what they needed for their strategic planning. In that case, Psycho said. Shall we begin targeting the offspring? That won't be necessary, Ludmilla replied. What I want to see is how they act amongst themselves. That should offer us insights into their social structures, value systems and at what point everything starts to fall apart. 
We have an entire country filled with beastmen to drive off, so having a sense of how they will act while we do so and what threats they may present to the Draconic Kingdom subjects while that happens is one of our priorities. Don't do anything to influence their behavior unless it's to keep them on course and push them forward. The course in this case was back the way that they came. Those that strayed from that path would be encouraged to return to it. The beastmen would be dissuaded from getting close to any human settlements, as well. Hundreds of wraiths patrolled the northern border while hundreds of bone vultures tracked tribal movements. Their ground forces would herd them southeast, rolling them back over the occupied territories and spreading awareness of the undead advance. In addition to observing their social behaviors, they would be measuring their long-distance endurance and the effects of stress and hunger on each species. What interested her the most, however, was what would happen once they started crossing into the territory of other clans. Would they fight? Would they band together to face a common foe? What would they do to the human populations under their control? Every act would offer valuable insights and present avenues of exploitation to more efficiently combat their foes. I still don't get it, Raoul said. Our army is so strong, so why does any of that matter? We could just tell the infantry squads to stomp everything flat and they'd do it. All those battles that we did over the winter feel pointless if a commander can just point and everything dies. That's a complacent line of thinking, Raoul, she told him. It's true that, if it comes to a contest of raw strength, we hold an overwhelming advantage, but it does not mean we will always hold an advantage. In the event that we don't, we need to be able to put up a real fight. Furthermore, what we're doing here is not simply defeating our enemies, we're learning about the world that we live in. Then what about our training, my lady? Olga asked, everything here is so huge compared to that. It's like our league battles are just little games. Well, that's not incorrect, Ludmilla answered. While they do get larger at higher leagues, I intended for them to be game-like matches. The purpose, however, is to challenge our commanders. Challenge stimulates growth. As Raoul has noted, obtaining victory with the royal army is easy. War is best fought unfairly, within reason. Everything we're doing here so far is one-sided and we've been more concerned about gathering information and executing the best plans possible than struggling with a difficult adversary. What do you mean by challenge stimulates growth? Hmm, you should understand this already, no? Ludmilla said, if you take on difficult tasks, you'll go back to the things that you did before and find them remarkably easy. This tends to work for most experiences, so striving to do greater things all the time leads to rapid growth. That's why I always encourage everyone to challenge themselves and allocate a portion of the domain budget towards facilitating their advancement. Every person who advances in their craft makes Warden's Vale that much better. As officers of the Royal Army, you need to become the best commanders possible while you can afford to, not discover that your skills are insufficient when you can't afford to lose. I thought you did it because the scriptures said so, Raoul said. There is a reason why our scriptures say so, Ludmilla said. Learning why they do helps greatly in understanding why the gods imparted that knowledge to us and its importance in our lives. She would elaborate further, but her own knowledge on the matter was incomplete and often abstract. While the vast majority of the Sorcerous Kingdom's citizens weren't aware of the existence of class levels and their effect on every aspect of their lives, they still grew and developed themselves. Rather than directly imparting awareness of the system to them, the Sorcerer King and his vassals agreed that indirect measures should be enacted to cultivate growth and development. The reasons for this were varied, but they were not necessarily at odds with one another. Almost all were of the opinion that in-depth knowledge of class levels was to be suppressed because of the dangers that it represented. While it wasn't guaranteed to be the case, it did not appear that the countries in the region were aware of their existence. Any knowledge of class levels spreading beyond the Sorcerous Kingdom's borders could result in that knowledge being turned against them. The group of the Sorcerer King's courtiers that Ludmilla was closest to, namely, Lady Shiltir and her two cousins, believed that development should be promoted in a naturalistic way and experimented in that direction. As class levels were theoretical concepts made manifest, incomplete concepts would result in incomplete class levels, or potentially some unforgivable snarl of disparate class levels. Thus, it was better for society and its individuals to develop in a comprehensive manner. Each had a different take on how this natural growth could occur. Lady Shiltier tended to focus on how things should be and what looks good, which usually solidified into themes for individuals. She was particularly touchy about women, 
which could be seen, or maybe felt, from how she treated her subordinates. Ludmilla was one set of ideas, Clara was another, Leanne was something else and Florian was another bundle of things. Rather than anything concrete, it was all about flavor, image or sensation. Even Elishnish was subjected to her influence, though the Frost Dragon was naturally naturalistic and needed no prompting to act that way. Lady Aura's vocation as a beast tamer seemed to dominate her views on class development. Everyone was a thing that could evolve or grow to become a better thing. All those things had things they could do that were associated with the things that those things should be able to do. Despite the vagueness of everything, she was a strict disciplinarian and one could imagine her cracking her whip whenever she asserted herself on the topic. Lord Mayor probably had the most practice with class development, as he ran the adventurer training area. He was a bit spontaneous, but his efforts often brought about tangible results. Probably because everything he threw at the adventurers was a life and death struggle around the time they reached gold rank. The common thing about their approaches was that they were intuitive and feely, which drove rational thinkers like Clara and Leanne crazy. Overall, however, the insights that they provided were instrumental in Ludmilla and her friends' efforts to analyze class-level development and use that knowledge to create practical systems for the Sorceress Kingdom. Broadly speaking, the Sorceress Kingdom was an experiment on a national scale and everyone was a source of data. Their lineage, upbringing, choices, careers, and the families that they raised, in short, the sum of their lives, served to paint a picture of how the world worked. How nature, economics, institutions, culture and society were affected by and affected the nation and its people were factored in. Ultimately, this knowledge went into efforts to seamlessly guide class-level development through education, value systems and national ideas. This was practiced, both intentionally and unintentionally, by every civilization that they knew of, no matter how primitive or advanced they appeared to be. Ludmilla doubted that there were any exceptions to this. It was a fundamental aspect of the class system, one was what they were and so they did what they did. Society naturally developed roles, and, as society evolved, cultural mores, specialized castes, institutions and all of the traditions and knowledge that were built up around them gave rise to new and unique job classes. For the most part, it was natural, meaning that people pursued concepts passed down through common sense, law and imagination rather than having any specific knowledge of the job class system and attempting to force new jobs out of nothing. The most prevalent examples of the natural process being perfected, or at least developed to a reliable form could be found in the civilian sector with vocational advancement. Children became apprentices starting around the age of six and their education was tailored to meet guild regulations. The guilds were institutions that had evolved to manage the various industries and services that existed in society. The temples could be seen as the priest guild and had its own regulations and apprentices in the form of acolytes and squires. The nobility was also an institution in the same sense. Noble scions became pages and maids, which were essentially apprenticeships in the aristocratic establishment. As this had all existed in Reistise, the citizens of the Duchy of E. Rantel had inherited these systems and were intimately familiar with them. When knowledge of the class system was applied, it reshaped one's perception of apprenticeships and how they worked in relation to class levels became clear. Through generations of trial and error, Systems of education had manifested apprentice job classes that allowed students to safely advance in their vocations without risk of build contamination, assuming they didn't go out of their way to do so. The next step was to take the apprentice system and apply it to formalized educational institutions with standardized curriculums. Two examples of such institutions existed in the region, the temple schools and universities of the slain theocracy and the imperial magic academy of the Baharuth Empire which fed into the Imperial Army's Military Academy, the Imperial Ministry of Magic and the various other universities in our winter. Only Clara was somewhat familiar with the Theocracy's universities, but they had all seen the Empire's institutions and documentation of their methods and curriculums were available on demand if the Sorceress Kingdom requested it. Addressing the critical flaws in these existing systems was the first thing that needed to be done, but those flaws were not instantly remedied. The foremost of these flaws was the absence of basic universal education. It was understandably impossible in the Empire and even in the Sorceress Kingdom, but there was one place in the Sorceress Kingdom where it was possible, Warden's Vale. 
Since its population was tiny and its economy was optimized around the Sorceress Kingdom's new industrial practices, it had become a sort of laboratory for national development. That being said, having everything lined up perfectly didn't mean that everything happened perfectly. The idea that they were a laboratory was obvious with the experimental nature of everything that they did. Ludmilla was an experimental subject. As were her tenants, their families and their industries. Olga and Raoul were experimental apprentices and their party in the Draconic Kingdom campaign was an experiment in practical education. Ludmilla gazed down at their current laboratory. Somewhere, someone would be decrying her for transforming an entire country into an experimental exercise. At least if they knew what was going on. Then again, it was probably a matter of perspective. One learned life's lessons in whatever they did. It looks like the camps are clear, Ludmilla said. Make sure they're dismantled and the contents sorted out for analysis while we give our new furry friends a decent lead. It will be done, my lady. How are things going down in the valley? We have tallied approximately 3,000 corpses, Psycho reported. 90% of the remaining beastmen have been repurposed for our use. What shall we do with the corpses? Send them to Lady Entima, Ludmilla replied. She'll figure out what goes where. What happened to that significant asset that I ordered captured? Regrettably, they perished. She frowned at the unexpected answer. Were they so strong that we couldn't subdue them? I don't recall any significant losses to our forces being reported. There were, unforeseen circumstances, Psycho said. A miscalculation, perhaps. Elaborate. What we deem to be non-lethal means were employed to render the subject harmless. There were complications. The sergeants responsible for the capture operation hypothesized that the debilitating effects of our spells caused the subject to succumb to the effects of advanced age. It was a story-like development where an old warrior did not fall in battle, but to the ravages of old age. She hadn't ever heard of one where it happened while they were being zapped by elder liches, however. What did you use? Ray of enfeeblement. Initial applications achieved the expected results, but continued applications caused the subject to perish. Could that happen? As far as she knew, ability damage could not bring the associated physical attribute to zero. Did that not take into account the effects of aging? Or perhaps it was the target's raw power keeping them from succumbing to frailty? That's unfortunate, she said. We'll have to keep this in mind in the future. Send the body to storage, but make sure that it's catalogued as an exceptional subject. Maybe someone back in the Sorcerer's Kingdom can do something with it. Ludmilla let out a quiet sigh, wondering how much information had been lost. We're going to Blighthold next, right? Raoul asked. She turned her gaze to the south, where a bank of fog was creeping down the shore. That's right, she smiled slightly. Blighthold is next. Another captain will be doing the honors, however, one who has been waiting for this for a long, long time. A cool gust of night wind rolled in from the sea and blew over the walls. Tadora Osleth shivered and rubbed his arms. He peered at the shoreline to the northwest of Blighthold, where a strange fog had been creeping slowly towards the city since nightfall. A curse rolled off his tongue. Just what we need. Old Iska's hating on us something fierce. Watch your mouth, boy, a man twenty years his senior sent a baleful gaze his way. We already got enough problems without the storm god raining lightning down on our heads. This fog's too early, Chester, another sentry, noted. Can't be an hour past midnight. See what you did. The older man spat, had to wag your tongue like that. What? Tadora scowled back at him, it was already there before I said anything. Hey. A voice echoed from the nearest tower, quit your blathering and watch those beast men. Who the hell put him in charge? He sent a dirty look at the top of the tower, where a man that was far too well fed lounged on a cushy chair. We should throw his ass off the wall, Tadora muttered. Bet he'd feed a beast man family for a week. I'd shut up if I were you, Chester's voice was low. Last person who said that accidentally tripped so hard he flew over the Merlins. Tadora tucked his spear a sharpened stick, really, under his arm, scratching his head with his free hand. He wasn't sure what was worse, the beastmen outside the walls or the people who took charge of the city after the occupation set in, they were all merchants and shady folk who could bribe or coerce people into following them. Life had turned into a free-for-all in Blighthold. It probably wasn't the beastmen's fault. Not directly, at least. 
The invaders had overrun the countryside, but the way they stayed on top of things was strange. For the most part, people were left alone. Humans could travel from place to place so long as they didn't try to leave the territory. The beastmen sunk all the boats for the same reason. Anyone caught trying to fix the boats was eaten. Farming villages kept farming and the fishing villages kept fishing from the shore. Woodcutters had some problems because the tribes moved into the bigger copses, but fuel was generally not a problem with so many people gone. Up to that point, life was oddly close to normal. After that, everything revolved around how the beastmen managed things. One would have never thought it, but there was a specific order to how they ate people. First, they went after strong people. It didn't matter whether they fought or not. Soldiers, militia, hunters, adventurers, even priests and alchemists were targeted. They made a point of dragging off arcane casters when they noticed them. Secondly, they went after leaders, or at least what they recognized as leaders. This mostly meant the nobles. After that, they ate the useless. The streets of the towns and cities were picked clean of spares and homeless people. Anyone that resembled bureaucrats, clerks, scribes, sages or bards were dinner sooner or later. Everyone over forty or so was taken, too. Lastly, the beastmen got rid of metal workers, bowyers and anyone who could make things that could hurt them. Not having metal tools to work with made life extraordinarily difficult and a lot of things were starting to fall apart. Overall, the citizens of Blighthold and its surrounding territories were rendered harmless. They could work, eat and not much else. To top things off, there were so many beastmen around that they were getting eaten into oblivion. The past two days had seen the lion beastmen in the north vacate the area, which gave Blighthold's defenders hope that they recognized the problem and had finally decided to move on. Unfortunately, the clan to the south came over the river to take their place. They were much better climbers than the previous bunch, making watch duty harrowing. That fog bank's getting close to the wall. Think the beastmen will use it to sneak in and snatch some people? Probably. Even though they overpowered humans, beastmen loved to ambush, pounce on and chase their prey. It was never enough to simply drag someone away. Tadora leaned over the edge of the battlements, looking for predators lurking below. The skies were clear and the moon was bright, making would-be raiders easy to spot. With the approach of the fog, however, he was absolutely sure something would end up on the walls to snatch a meal. Hey Chester, he said quietly, let's head over to the brazier. We won't be able to see anything from there. We won't be able to see shit in that fog anyway. Look, Chester said, we can't do that. The only chance we got is to poke beastmen off the wall while they're climbing up. If they make it to the top cause we weren't at our spots, we got no chance. They stared at each other for a good, long while. Then an arm with spotted fur reached in between the merlins and snatched Chester off of the wall. Shit, Tadora shouted, shit, shit, shit. Alarm. We got beastmen over here. He leaned over the parapet, jabbing at the jaguar beastman clinging to the wall. Three more were climbing up nearby and twice as many were emerging from the creeping fog below. The point of his wooden spear found the beastman's eye and it released its hold, disappearing into the mist. I, did I kill it? By Her Majesty's mosquito bites, I killed one. It couldn't have survived that fall. Beastmen were tough, but they weren't that tough. He ran over and started jabbing at the next closest climber. Damn it. What the hell are you doing, fat ass? Sound the alarm. The alarm didn't sound despite more shouts rising along the wall. Tadora drove his spear into the shoulder of another beast man before the others finished crawling over. He took a stab at the nearest one before kicking the brazier towards them. The beast men scattered back and Tadora fled in the other direction, the fog rolling over his feet. Shrieks of men being torn apart followed his panicked footsteps. A loud thud drowned them out as he slammed the tower door shut and barred the entry. He leaned against the wall chest heaving under his chain mail armor. He saw more men being shredded out the opposite door and ran over to slam that one shut, too. He backed away from the doors with wide eyes, waiting for the scrape of claws and the pounding of beastmen breaking their way in. It didn't happen. After a few breaths, reason returned to him. The beastmen camped near the city weren't that strong. That he could get away at all was proof of that. They wouldn't be able to break down iron reinforced doors. What do I do? He could go down the stairs and into the city, but, if the walls were taken, the beastmen would be dragging the citizens out of their bed soon enough. 
His eyes followed the stairwell up. He grew more annoyed by the moment. Why isn't that arsehole sounding the alarm? Tadora padded up the stairs. If the fat bastard had fallen asleep, he'd push him off the wall himself. Fog flowed over the steps and he froze at the sight that greeted him. The watch sergeant was lying on the floor, staring up at the sky. His torso was torn open, snapped ribs turning his chest into a toothy maw. A pair of bright yellow eyes met Tadora's as the beast man feasting on the man looked up from its meal. With a wordless shriek, he lunged forward with his spear. The point jabbed into the beast man's arm, but it failed to penetrate its hide. A snarl filled the air and the beast man rose to its full height, snatching Dodora's weapon away and casting it over the parapet. In the distance, the clang of alarms carried over the blowing wind. What was the point in coming up here? A paw slammed into his chest, driving out his breath and scattering links of mail over the stone. His shoulder hit the doorframe and he bounced off, falling heavily to the floor. The beast man's claws scraped over the floor as it came to tower over him. Tadora pulled his dagger, driving the point down at the furry foot in front of him. The beast man pulled back and kicked him to the side. Tadora's helmet banged against the wall and his vision blanked for a moment. Is that all you have, human? The beast man sneered. He turned his swimming gaze up at the massive dummy human. Then his eyes went past it to a wooden wall that had appeared just past the parapet. Tadora raised a gloved hand weakly to point at it. The beast man turned just in time to see a swarm of brilliant bolts streaking towards it. They soundlessly struck its chest and the beast man flopped lifelessly to the ground. Tadora looked up to find countless points of crimson light in portals that drifted by the tower. A ship? But, huh? Maybe he hit his head harder than he thought. Then again, the beastman was very much dead. He pushed himself to his feet, shuffling over to the tower's parapet. Tadoro squeezed his eyes shut and opened them again, but what he saw didn't change. Sailing outside the wall was a massive galleon with tattered sails that glowed in the moonlit mist. Never mind that it shouldn't be able to sail in that condition, the outside of the northern wall was land. As the ship cruised silently along the city's fortifications, dozens of figures leapt out from a gaping hole in its hull, landing on the walls. Wicked scimitars flashed as they fell upon the beastmen, sending arcs of liquid crimson into the moonlight. Tadora leaned forward, eyes following the vessel as it rounded the walls. Magical bolts continued to stream from the portholes of the ship, sweeping beastmen away like a torrent of brilliant hail. A tremendous arc of electricity emanated from the galleon's bow and coursed over the wall, burning its afterimage in his vision. When his sight recovered, only a line of charred bodies remained where three dozen invaders once stood. The fog grew thick, obscuring the mysterious vessel, but brilliant flashes of light marked its deadly course. Tadora took a step back, trying to make sense of what was going on. They appeared to be allies, but the Draconic Kingdom didn't have any allies with flying galleons. He paced around the tower, looking down at the forces that had stormed the walls. Crimson points of light stared up at him from bare skulls. Tadoro stumbled away from the edge with a fearful shout. Skeletons? He scrambled down the tower stairs, nearly falling twice. The undead were attacking them. No, the beastmen were being attacked by the undead, no, that didn't make any sense. They were enemies of all life, meaning that humans would be attacked alongside the beastmen. Tadora reached the city streets, finding the citizens out of their homes and looking up at the walls in confusion. They probably couldn't make out the figures in the fog, else there'd be mass panic. Soldier, a man called out to him. Tadora looked away. I'm not a soldier, damn it. I just manned the wall for some bread. Soldier. What's going on up there? Dozens of eyes were on him now. He kept walking. Soldier. What's going? I don't know. He needed to escape before the undead moved from butchering the beastmen to butchering the citizens. His steps took him towards the city's main gate. A small crowd had formed there and nervous murmurs filled the air. The undead. The undead have come. They've taken the wall, how do we get out? The gatehouse was taken as well. Powerful looking skeletons with round shields and the same scimitars that slaughtered the beastmen barred the way. Tadora turned around. If the gate was blocked, they could only swim out of the port. By the time he made it there, however, the wharf was lined by the undead. Moored at the longest pier was the ship that had flown by the wall. Atop its mainmast was a vermilion ensign with a gold insignia that he had never seen before. 
A gangplank extended from the galleon to the pier and a tall figure disembarked. The steady tap of a cane against wooden planks echoed over the water as it strode through the mist at a leisurely pace. Rather than fleeing the approach of whatever it was, the people waited with fearful looks. There was no escape and the being making its way over had surely come to announce their fate. The first thing Dora noticed was that it wasn't human. Not that he expected it to be a human, but for some reason he thought it'd be an undead thing in some human shape. It was tall, as tall as a beast man lord. Upon closer inspection, he saw that it was a beast man, at least a skeleton of one. Above a finely tailored outfit that should have probably gone on a noble, two crimson points flared in the empty sockets of its bestial skull. A broad tricorn with a huge white plume rested atop its head. It took two steps onto the boards of the wharf, then stopped. More than a few audible swallows could be heard from the crowd. You'll have to forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, the undead beastman said, but we can't let you out of the city for a while. A long silence stretched into the night. Was that it? How, how long is a while? The undead beastman's gaze fixed onto the speaker. A fearful gasp rose from the man. He covered his mouth and shook his head as if to deny that he had spoken. Hmm, a week, maybe? The undead beast man said, the fellows out there are being cleared away and we don't want them running in here. Cleared away? Someone asked, what does that mean? It means what it means. These lands are being liberated and you'll be back to your regular lives soon enough. Murmurs of worry and disbelief rose from the crowd. Was he telling the truth? Was there any reason to make up such a tale? The undead were beings of unfathomable evil, so there must be some dark purpose behind its words. W.H. Who are you? The undead being rose to its full height at the question. The crowd took a collective step back. The name's Iska, captain of the Ruins Wake and chief proprietor of the Katza Merchant Company, it swept the hat off of its head and performed a strangely elegant bow. I look forward to doing business with you. Eleventh day, upper wind month, 1 CE, 0700 hours. The cries of gulls mixed with the lapping of the waves against the rocky pier. Ludmilla alighted on the wooden walkway beside Ruin's wake, touching her fingers lightly to her hull. Good morning, she said. A light glow played over the ghost ship's length in response. Booted steps sounded from above and a tall figure looked down from the railing. Baroness. Captain Iska called down gaily, it's always good to see you again. Captain Iska, Ludmilla smiled in greeting. I thought you'd be wandering around the city now that they finally aren't trying to chase you away. I wanted to. The elder lich replied, got about as far as the wharf before Miss Marchant glared me straight back into my cabin. Said I disrupt business. Ludmilla's gaze followed the procession of skeleton warriors unloading cargo from Ruin's Wake. At the end of the pier, a woman in merchant's garb stood at a table, speaking with a slightly differently garbed man. Behind the man were more merchants forming a long line that stretched along the waterfront. That's strange. No kidding. Iska growled, I'm an upstanding member of civilized society. Why would I disrupt business? I don't believe that you purposely would, Ludmilla said, but that wasn't what I was commenting on. Why is trade being conducted on the pier? To be honest, the elder lich said, that's how I thought things worked before we actually went into business. While common folk who bought goods from stalls and shops might believe that to be the case, it generally wasn't. With even a single wagon, negotiations were conducted through representatives who usually placed orders in advance or dealt in large quantities through the merchant guild or its affiliates. Even non-merchants bringing goods into the city went to have them assessed by the guilds and conducted their business through the relevant organizations. Those who handled large volumes, nobles, merchant caravans, shipping fleets and urban wholesalers, did not operate like plaza stalls or roadside peddlers. It was simply too inefficient and time-consuming. I'll be heading into the city to take care of some things, Ludmilla told the elder lich. You may accompany me if you wish, but I'm going to see what's going on with Miss Marchant first. Ludmilla concealed her presence and made her way over to stand near the goods unloaded behind Miss Marchant's stall. She frowned as she watched the same merchant from before loom over the young woman sitting behind her table. I'll take everything. I'm sorry, sir, but I'll pay more than the rest of these mooks combined. A barrage of curses rolled out from behind the man at his audacious offer. I'm afraid I can't do that, sir, Miss Marchand replied. Our rates are set and there is a hard limit of goods per wagon. You're just cheating yourself. 
A fleck of spittle flew through the air, what kind of merchant are you? If you're not making a purchase, sir, then please make way for the next company. The merchant tossed a bag of coins onto the table with an incensed huff. He jerked his head towards a set of men standing around a set of wagons nearby. After confirming the man's order, the purser of the ruins wig led the laborers over to a neatly ordered set of goods awaiting transport. She walked past the line of skeleton warriors guarding the cargo, but the men all stopped a dozen meters away. Miss Marchand walked to the loading area before turning around. She looked over at the trembling laborers and let out a sigh. This all seems rather unorthodox, Lud Miller noted. Miss Marchand jumped and whipped around so quickly that her glasses nearly flew off of her face. While dressed in the conservative fashion that was customary to the southern territories of the Sorceress Kingdom, the form-fitting uniform couldn't conceal the bounce of her ample figure. The young merchant's hand went up to write them and she peered at Ludmilla for a moment before moving to fix her appearance, brushing back the long locks of her golden hair before replacing her black felt cap. Baroness Saradnik, she lowered herself into a respectful curtsy. I was not aware that you had arrived in Blighthold. I suppose your cargo handlers are not very talkative, Ludmilla smirked. Those glasses you're wearing are new, I think. They are, my lady. I purchased them from Warden's Vale a few weeks ago. They're quite nice. What do they do? Eye strain prevention, Miss Marchand replied, which is a lifesaver with all the paperwork and inventory work I have to deal with. They also provide dark vision up to 10 meters. I was not aware we were selling anything like that, Ludmilla said. They are something undergoing research, but I did not expect anything practical so soon. Jermaine Linez had been tasked with various things, but they were all side projects to her main job of running the faculties she was responsible for. One of those tasks was to produce high-quality dark vision items that could match and eventually surpass those produced for the Imperial Army. I am no artisan, my lady, Miss Marchand said, but I think your people have a good sense for business. Many artisans get caught up in their own research and development and the idea that they want to make something worthy of their effort. Snooty pure mage types consider item production as something that they do on the side to fund their passions. Well, I contracted artisans who were also merchants. I also urge them to make practical things for my domain. That undoubtedly helps, but something else is going on. I cannot say it is any one thing, but there is a feeling in Warden's Vale. I guess I get sort of the same feeling in certain other parts of the Sorceress Kingdom, like in Colin Harbour and Wagner County's new town. The world is changing dash that sort of feeling. No one wants to miss out. Was that how it was? Change was certainly occurring in the places she described, but Ludmilla didn't sense anything supernaturally extraordinary in it. Speaking of change, Ludmilla said, Captain Iska has been trying to trade at this port for over a century. He said that you chased him back onto Ruin's Wake when he ran out to see the city. That bony cat is too curious by far, the purser muttered. I can imagine his excitement, but we have a business to run first and foremost. Why are you trading from a stall, anyway? Miss Marchand looked over at the still frozen laborers, who were starting to receive jeers from the other men waiting to do business. She turned back and came close to Ludmilla, leaning forward to speak in a low voice. This city is in a mess. I could feel it just from coming into port. Ludmilla had felt it as well, though it had to do with a noble sense for things rather than emergence. Blighthold wasn't nearly as bad as Facet County, but the place was clearly ailing. The entire Draconic Kingdom was like that, though she thought it was only to be expected given their situation. She supposed that a merchant coming from the healthy and ever more prosperous lands of the Sorceress Kingdom would be given pause by the distinct gap between the two countries. That is part of why we have come, Ludmilla told her. To set things right again. The feeling will subside eventually and you can take pride in your role in restoring order to the Draconic Kingdom. Miss Marchand's hand went to her breast, her fingers pinching at something under the fabric of her blouse. If Sir Sana wills it, she said, then his will shall be done. Most of the problems here are more your field, though, my lady. I suppose that's what I'm about to go out and address, Ludmilla replied. Have you been around the city? I went to the Merchant Guild first. The purser answered. The staff is just, gone. The guilds, the administration, the military, the entire management level of Blighthold is gutted. I asked around to figure out what happened and the people say that everyone that the beastmen thought was useless was eaten. 
One is either someone who produces food or other essentials or they are livestock. Mature livestock is butchered from oldest to youngest. The merchants seem to be alive and well, Ludmilla looked pointedly towards the line at the table. They make a strange sort of exception for merchants, Miss Marchand said. Merchants are allowed to convey a short list of permitted goods around the territory, but they are prohibited from leaving. I have always heard about how the countries out in the world treat merchants differently, but I never imagined, well, everything else that is left unsaid. Why was the merchant killed cold, then? Because they are not considered merchants, my lady, Miss Marchand told her. The staff there are administrators. Clerks, basically. Non-essential by beastman standards. I see. As Miss Marchand said, it was something one wouldn't usually consider. Merchants from abroad spoke of being able to freely travel and conduct their business as long as they observed local customs and regulations. From their perspective, they were fine, but it didn't necessarily mean that everyone else was. I wonder how Blythold maintains public order if that is the case. I am not sure that they do, the purser replied. The militia here are more like thugs working for bread. They do what their employers tell them to, which probably amounts to defending their personal property. I think that there is also some sort of pool for manning the fortifications, but that is about as close to normal duties as these men perform. That is why I set the skeleton warriors to guard things here, I do not expect any sort of proper law enforcement to exist. That is probably a prudent measure, Ludmilla nodded. Lady Corlin would be interested in a report on the state of affairs here. I will include everything in my report at the end of the day, my lady. One of the crates close by shifted. It appeared that the laborers had finally worked up the courage to cross the line of skeleton warriors. At any rate, Miss Marchant said, how we have been driven to handle things right now may be a blessing in disguise. How so? Well, I do not wish to sound like hey. Cross that line and I'm adding you to the crew. A laborer headed for a different pile of goods leapt back with a shriek. A nearby skeleton warrior turned its attention towards him. The man scurried away empty-handed past the line of pale-faced merchants. Things like that, Miss March sighed. The lawless state of the land has probably produced a bunch of brazen fellows. Some people do whatever they think they can get away with to gain an edge. You heard the merchant from just now, too. The one that was trying to buy everything? I know we set regulations for distribution, but why would he be so, belligerent about them? Because the flow of goods here has slowed to a crawl. Supply and demand place all of the easily movable assets, gold in this case, but also jewelry, art and other valuables, into the hands of those with essential goods. That merchant is trying to monopolize this shipment so he can shift as much of the gold supply in the city to his company as possible. By doing so, he will have the greatest purchasing power and can monopolize the next shipment more easily. Do not get me wrong, I would normally be making them compete for my goods. But some of these people do not seem to care if the world burned as long as they could turn a copper coin from it. There are also those who love the feeling of power they hold over others when they have what everyone needs. Degenerate heretics, if you ask me. Do you mean to imply that this would happen even if the administration was intact? I do not know anything about them, my lady, the purser replied, so anything I say is simply based on what I have seen so far. If it was just the merchant guild, they would not stop their members from doing anything so long as it is legal and compliant with guild regulations. Moving goods and turning a profit is what merchants do, after all. They would trade our goods back and forth between themselves until prices are high enough that they worry the next trade will leave them holding the bag. The people, of course, have no choice but to pay whatever prices the merchants settle on. At least until they feel that they have no choice but to steal. So the measures we've put in place prevent that? Ludmilla asked. Since they lack the resources to deliver goods to every corner of the Draconic Kingdom, Clara and the others would be relying on existing channels of distribution. They also set limits for each merchant company that dealt with them, presumably to ensure fairness. Not explicitly, Miss Marchand said. It just slows down the process. Selling everything to one merchant company only gives them the buying power to dominate the next shipment without making them work for it. One or two more shipments will be needed to start making prices stick. Why is that? Captain Iska's purser gave her an odd look before seeming to realize something. Well, right now these people still have a siege mentality. The idea that things are scarce makes them hoard what they can and it keeps prices high in their heads. 
Just telling them that more goods will be coming in will not work. We have to demonstrate that deliveries will continue by reliably performing them according to schedule. Once we have them accept that as the new reality, they will go from hoarding inventories to moving them so they can make room for the next shipment. Will things go so smoothly? Ludmilla asked. I cannot speak for every merchant, my lady, Miss Marchand answered, but it should be the general flow of things. Goods not being sold are not making a profit. Storage costs money. Sitting on their inventories in hopes that prices will stay high is a losing proposition because someone else will be selling into the demand. I do not expect it to all happen at once, but when the rest of our merchants start arriving, they will guarantee that everyone falls in line. Ludmilla nodded slowly as the merchant spoke, not quite understanding everything that she was saying. Most of what she knew about trade were things that she picked up from Clara. As far as it went, she had the grasp of wide-scale economics that one might expect of a noble, but the intricacies of trade and industry was something that she generally left to her friends or the people who worked in House Saradnik's companies. While she was waging war against the Beastmen, her friends were waging a different sort of war, one that she didn't think she would be much help in. Once the first merchant's laborers finished moving their goods, Miss Marchand excused herself so she could deal with the next. The sound of clawed feet over the boards of the pier drew Ludmilla's attention to Captain Isker, who had cast invisibility on himself. I hope you're aware that you can still be heard, Ludmilla said. In response, the elder lich brought a clawed finger up to his fleshless lips, glancing at Mistress Marchand. Was she really so fearsome? Ludmilla supposed that the purser could be intimidating in various ways. They walked off the pier and followed the street lining the wharf. With the city harboring three times its population and the arrival of Ruin's Wake drawing curious onlookers, it was difficult to find a way past the crowds through which the elder lich invisibly following her could fit. A wagon loaded with newly purchased cargo eventually trundled by and they followed the crowd that followed it up one of the main thoroughfares. When it turned down a side lane, Ludmilla kept heading towards the city center. She wrinkled her nose as they made their way away from the waterfront and the air grew thick with the scent of squalor. One component of that squalor that was notably missing, however, was the lack of manure from livestock and draft animals. I wonder if the beast men ate all of the livestock first, she muttered. I still see plenty of livestock around, Captain Iska said. Ludmilla threw a look over her shoulder at the elder lich. If draft animals and other livestock have been eaten, she said, there will be problems working the fields. Goods derived from that livestock will also be missing, not just meat and milk but wool, leather, glue and products from whatever else they once raised here. Well, I don't know about all that animal product stuff, my lady, but can't they just lease undead labor as you do in the sorcerer's kingdom? While it would certainly please his majesty, Ludmilla said, there's no guarantee that the draconic kingdom will so willingly adopt undead labor. Hmm, drop your invisibility. Screams echoed down the street as the nearby citizens nearly trampled one another to get away from the elder lich. Ludmilla frowned as a wide bubble devoid of humans formed around them when they continued walking along. See? She said, you saved their city from the beastmen and they're still scared witless of you. I can't imagine that the reception for Death Series servitors will be much better. Humph. How irrational. Humans are so finicky. They will hopefully adapt in time, Ludmilla said. Until then, you'll likely be experiencing similar reactions to what you've seen here thus far. It's not all uniform, though. I'm sure some will warm up to you sooner rather than later, you have quite the charming personality, after all. Their path took them past a dilapidated building with a familiar sign over the entrance. Ludmilla stopped and exchanged a look with Captain Iska. Not interested? She asked. I did want to see what the Magician Guild in Blighthold had, Captain Iska answered, but it looks like it's about to fall apart. Ludmilla went up the steps to test the wooden door, which hung awkwardly on its bottom hinge. After testing whether it would move normally, she lifted the door and pushed it aside. A voice drifted out from inside. How in the, I-E-E-E-E? -E -E -E? A skinny man sitting at the reception counter leapt up in fright and dashed up the stairs. Rude, Captain Iska's voice came down from behind her. From the top of the stairwell, a hand with a stick pointed down at them. Come no further. A trembling voice came down the stairs, I have a wand and I know how to use it. What kind of wand is it? Captain Iska asked curiously. It's. The wand turned to the side for a moment, then pointed back down at them, a wand of magic arrow. 
They don't miss, you know? Plus, they hurt. Technically, he's not wrong, the elder lich said. What are we going to do, my lady? I'm not even sure why we're here anymore, Ludmilla replied. If you have no business with the magician guild, the voice said, then I suggest that you vacate the premises. Many powerful magic casters reside within, you should leave before you anger them. Well, Captain Iska said, now I am even more interested. G go away. We mean you no harm, Ludmilla said. That is in no way convincing with an elder lich standing there. Charming someone and having them speak for you won't work, no matter how pretty they are. Ludmilla looked at Captain Iska. The elder lich took a step back. I swear I didn't do anything of the sort, my lady. She rolled her eyes, stepping up onto the bottom of the stairs. Stop. The one trembled. Oh no, Ludmilla's voice was flat. The evil elder lich is sending me up against my will with his evil magic. I don't want to die. Please don't kill me. Boo hoo hoo. The one dipped slightly. You vile fiend. The voice cried, are there no limits to your depravity? Hey. Captain Iska said, that's not a nice thing to say to a lady. Ludmilla reached up and snatched the wand away. I'm fairly certain he was addressing you, she told the elder lich. She finished going up to the second floor. Around the corner of the stairs, the skinny man cowered on the floor while six others looked down the hallway at her from the entrances of several rooms. The place smelled like it hadn't been cleaned for a month or more. She brought her hand up to cover her mouth and nose. Don't you have clean spells? We have more important things to learn, someone said defensively, the mysteries of the arcane await no wizard. That's right. Begone, woman. Ludmilla smacked the wand against the wall. The mages in the doorframe started and went into hiding. Ludmilla stared down at the man on the floor, tapping the wand steadily against her thigh. Where is your guildmaster? She asked. D dead, the man answered. She died last autumn. Then who is the ranking member of this magician guild? Me? Um, that would be me. The man's eyes followed his wand. He reached out for it. Ludmilla switched him across the wrist. Ow! He blushed. A furrow formed on Ludmilla's brow. She gave the major long look before going back down the stairs, flipping the wand through the air towards Captain Iska. The stick of wood bounced several times from claw to claw before the elder lich caught it. You'll probably have better luck with them than me, she said as she strode out the door. Don't break any laws, I need to go find whoever is in charge of the city now. She continued on her way deeper into the city passing plazas packed with tents and makeshift dwellings formed out of scrap materials. A curious aroma caught her attention along the way, leading her to what looked like a skinned beast man roasting over a fire. Dozens of people waited around with wooden bowls in their hands. That's not something I see every day, Ludmilla said. Did the watch kill it? A man nearby snorted. Those mooks on the wall don't do shit. It's when the beastmen get into the city, they step into family turf and they come out as meat. Literally. Ludmilla nodded thoughtfully, leaving the crowd behind. Rangers, urban rangers? No, probably just rogues. Rogues in the Adventurer Guild or those serving governments in some capacity were probably the minority of a city's total rogue population. Most would ply their trade as something most would not recognize as a rogue's profession. They would also work as private security or exist as members of what people considered shady organizations. Then there were the ones who unapologetically engaged in criminal activity. A determined and organized force of rogues would probably turn a city into a death trap for beastmen who were unaccustomed to human environs. It was something that she had never considered, but it made sense in hindsight. In the largest plaza, she found a building with the markings of the city hall. The place had been turned into a makeshift keep with barricades and sentries all around. As with Seagate, the men on watch duty were completely oblivious to her presence. Their conversation didn't seem to amount to much. Mostly gossip, complaints and the occasional bit of local humor. The complaints were generally directed at those with resources and a few individuals that sounded like they had some sort of authority. Like everywhere else in the draconic kingdom that she had been, no one voiced any grievances with Queen Auriculus. After a while, she entered the city hall. Men stationed in the foyer raised their spears at her sudden appearance. The spearheads just as quickly lowered, wavering in uncertainty. She scanned the individuals present, aside from the makeshift security, 
those lounging further and did not have the air of nobles, bureaucrats or anyone else that one would expect in an administrative office. I am Baroness Ludmilla Zarudnik, Chief of Staff of the Forces of the Sorceress Kingdom in the Draconic Kingdom. Is Blightholds Chief Administrator present? Silence filled the foyer in the wake of her query. Several seconds later, one of the men spoke. What? The mayor, Ludmilla replied. Or perhaps the highest ranked noble? They're all dead. Long time ago. Then who is in charge of the city? Ah. Uh, I'm in charge. A severe looking man with streaks of grey in his hair came out from deeper within the building. While well dressed, he did not carry himself as an aristocrat would. The sentries, however, did not challenge his statement. And you are? Nedim, the man replied. What's your business here? I've come with instructions from the capital, Ludmilla said. Please gather what remains of the administration as well as representatives from the guilds and temples. I also need to speak with the city militia and any surviving members of the Draconic Kingdom's royal army. Nedim turned around. This way, he said. Ludmilla followed the man into the central hall of the building, where furnishings had been placed in a manner akin to a lounge. Groups of men watched her from where they were seated. All of them were visibly armed, displaying sidearms at their belts while pole arms and long swords rested close at hand. Considering the situation they were in, it might be expected for even bureaucrats to equip themselves for battle, but they were clearly nothing of the sort. When was the last time this building has been attacked? Ludmilla asked. It gets attacked every week, Nedim said. But we've learned to keep the beastmen out. That's quite admirable, all things considered. Does that mean you've also been able to maintain some semblance of order in Blighthold? They came to a table in the center of the atrium. Nedim seated himself on a long couch on one side, resting a hand on each knee. So, he leaned back. What are these orders from the capital? Ludmilla frowned slightly, glancing at the men gathered around them. The lighting was dim, but it didn't matter to her. Those present, however, seemed to carry themselves with confidence in the shadowy surroundings. I don't see anyone that might qualify as a merchant, priest or military officer here, Ludmilla noted. Look, lady, Nedim folded his hands in front of him, it's simple. We're in charge here. You need something done, you tell us and we tell everyone else. Is that so? It is so. Ludmilla held the man's cold gaze, considering her options. Given that the entire country had been turned upside down, any number of things could have happened to the city. Ultimately, however, what she required was order. She reached into the infinite haversack on her right hip, producing Queen Auriculus royal writ and placing it on the table in front of Nadim. By order of the Queen, Ludmilla projected her voice over the assembled men, the city of Blighthold is to be barred and secured. Over the next few days, we will be driving the beastmen out of the province to the north. The majority of the clan occupying that area has already been annihilated by our forces. The remainder of the beastmen traversing the territory are merely refugees at this point, but they are still dangerous. We will not allow them any more time than necessary to linger, but they'll pick up meals on the way through if you leave any opportunities for them to do so. Murmurs rose from around the hall. Nedim leaned forward, reaching out to pick up the royal writ. You annihilated the clan north of us, he said. Why not finish off the rest? Rest assured, Ludmilla replied, not a single invader will remain in the Draconic Kingdom by the time we're done. Refugees, huh, Nedim eyed the seal on the royal writ. You're a cold lady, Zaradnik. I bet even the undead would fear you. You don't know the half of it, Ludmilla smirked. On that note, the Draconic Kingdom could use your services once we're done here. The man rose from his couch, touching the royal writ to his breast and lowering his head in a bow. Those gathered around them followed suit. The Balak family heeds the Queen's command, 